My name is Fred Hobbs, and I am Director of Public Relations at an organization called Imagine. I'm joined today by my colleague Mark Emery, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Imagine. And Imagine is an organization that provides services to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in Boulder and Broomfield County. So really, <coughs> right here, we're right in our backyard. Imagine was established more than 55 years ago by a group of parents who had kids who had developmental disabilities and those parents wanted their kids to have the exact same opportunities as all the other kids who lived in their neighborhoods and we continue to use that philosophy as the foundation of what we do. We believe in the potential of all and we work to create a world of opportunity for all abilities and one of the hallmarks of the way we do that work in the past 55 years has been being creative and innovative and looking at challenging problems from a new standpoint, a new way of attacking it. And that's what I want to talk about today. We're going to talk about an app we developed called Imaginect, where we think we're down, down the road of a U a new and unique way of solving a very challenging problem facing our field right now. What is that challenge? Well, you've already heard it, be, it got referenced this morning several times. We have a significant crisis when it comes to our direct support professional work staff. These are the frontline staff members, the ones who are really delivering the services. And they are the backbone of what we do. And as you've already saw this morning, technology has some ways of maybe lessening that need for direct support professionals, but that need is not going to go all the way away, and we have a significant problem of finding any of them right now. And this problem is not going to be going away anytime soon. There's a lot of reasons for this. These are difficult jobs. They don't pay very well because our funding tends to be governmental funding and those funds don't tend to keep up with the actual cost of doing business. There's an increased demand for service and there's a smaller workforce available to be providing those kinds of services. So we just don't see any reason that these, this crisis, this issue is going to go away anytime soon. However, as I already mentioned, fortunately, Imagine has a long history of innovation and creative problem solving. So knowing that this problem was coming, and this, we've known this for quite some time, we put our brains to work to see what we could do to come up with an interesting creative solution. And the very first thing we realized is if we're going to do this, we have to reimagine everything we know about how we find, recruit, hire, and deliver services. We had to reimagine who we were hiring. We had to reimagine how we actually hired them. We had to imagine what kind of positions we were hiring for. We had to imagine how we were actually laying out tasks for our employees who were doing the work. Because we knew that the old model wasn't going to work anymore. We needed to disrupt the paradigm, if you'll allow me to engage in a brief amount of corporate speak. But fortunately, in this case, we didn't have to be the smartest people in the room because there was already a model out there that has already disrupted the traditional way we look at the employer-employee role and how they work together and how they're modeled, and that is the gig economy. Now, you may not have heard the term gig economy, or if you have, forgive me, but even if you haven't heard the term, you know what it is because you've experienced it. We're talking about tools available to provide on-demand services of many types. These are tools like Uber, Lyft, OpenTable, HomeAdvisor, Angie's List, tools that make it easy, oftentimes just on your cell phone, to find yourself any number of services that you want. Maybe you want some cleaning services, repair, maintenance, childcare, dog sitting. They're all available there, easy at hand for you. So we had imagined, we asked ourselves, why can't we do something similar? So we started down that path. And in order to do it, we needed uh, some funding, first of all, because we are a nonprofit organization. 
And we're fortunate that we work in a community that's very generous and supportive of the work with the, that we do. And in December of 2016, we received an anonymous donation. And with that donation, we sought to create and test an on-demand tool like Uber or Lyft that would allow us to connect people with IDDs to workers who could complete specific tasks and help them in their service needs. The plan was to be a demonstration model um, that we could show that we could actually attract a, a pool of interested people who might be able to address our workforce needs, that DSP crisis, but shifting the focus to contingent workers. And the result would be that this trained pool of employees would be ready to work on their terms, not on Imagine's terms. And so then we did our research. We wanted to make sure that we were able to get a tool that acted in two important ways. One is that it paralleled other gig economy platforms. It needed to be something that people were already comfortable with, that they understood how it worked. However, it also had to be customizable enough to allow us to fit the unique needs for our organization working in such a heavy regulated environment as services for people with IDD. So we found the right company and Imaginect was born. It had the flexibility that we needed. It paralleled the other tools that were available on the market so people recognized how it worked. It was easy to download and access on multiple devices, your phones, your tablets, your desktop. It allowed Imagine or others to post tasks, post jobs, specific, specific jobs and the value of those jobs, what they'd get paid. Now I'm just gonna take a quick side note. You'll probably hear me and probably Mark use the term agent. That's the term that we sort of decided to use for the people who were posting the jobs, the ones who needed these, uh, this work to be filled. So if you hear us say agents, that's what I'm talking about. Now, so when these agents posted these jobs, these tasks, they needed to be visible to a bunch of potential respondents. And then on the respondent side, it needed, the tool needed to be able to deliver alerts and give potential respondents the ability to customize those alerts to their needs. So maybe somebody only wanted to work Sunday shifts. Maybe somebody only wanted morning shifts. They could set up an alert system that they would only get alerted for those kinds of jobs. Or maybe they only wanted a specific task. They needed to be able to set up those specific tasks. And then very importantly, it's basic but very important, that once a task was filled, somebody said, yes, I can do this, the agent, the person who posted the, ja the task was notified, and then the scheduled task job was no longer visible, so people weren't still trying to get it. So once we had all we wanted in those regards, we were ready to move forward, and the first usable version of Imaginect was available in com and complete in April of 2017 and made available on the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. You could even download it now if you'd like. So after we'd gone live and tested Imaginect to the point that we were confident, oops, I skipped forward a little, forgive me. Sorry about that. After we'd gone live and tested Imaginect to the point that we were confident enough to use it in a real life situation, we first started with a very small control group of both workers and tasks, and we only put it in one environment. We have group homes at Imagine. Uh, this is a picture of our Foothills group home. That's Rob in the center of the picture. He was our very first Imaginect employee. He started on June 5th in 2017. Now, following that initial test, we did a lot of meeting, had a lot of discussions about the app, what it meant on the front and the back ends, the applications, the implications of using such a tool. And as part of this, these discussions, we realized that maybe we should shift where we were going to focus the use of this tool on. We had a program within Imagine that maybe fit what we were looking for a little better. And that was our family recruited employee program. Now a brief description of this program. In this program, a family member actually recruits the employee to provide services for their loved ones who is receiving funding through Imagine. That is opposed to the more traditional model where Imagine was actually the people, was the organization doing the hiring and everything. 
So what this allows is for families to recruit individuals that they know, uh, that they trust, and it creates a unique partnership between the family, the individual in services, the employees, and Imagine. And it also made it a great candidate for testing further on Imaginect. So we began a program trial in February of 2018, and it went through May of the same year, so that was about 12 weeks. This was a controlled trial, and here's some of the stats, just so you know. We had 11 agents, again, the people who were uh, posting the jobs they needed filled, and 11 workers. Some more of the stats, nine of the 11 agents actually put out requests for work on the app. Five of the 11 workers accepted, completed, and documented work. Now, three of those workers only worked for one agent. This was probably somebody they already knew and were familiar with. But two of the workers responded to multiple agents. After that, we did some surveys of both the agents and the workers, and that's kind of where we are now. We've completed our first real trial, and this is a trial, this is a work in process. We still have a lot to do to figure out what this tool could mean for Imagine, but even broader for the IDD world. But as for a first test, we're very pleased. We've demonstrated what we wanted to demonstrate. This can and did work for us, which offers a perfect transition into my colleague Mark talking. He's going to discuss more about what we learned and also explore some important discussion points that are really key if we want to have a successful future in Imaginect or tools and products like it. So, Mark? Thanks, Fred. Um, I, I typically wouldn't be uh, standing in front of you unless I thought this was a pretty cool idea. But I'm gonna take just a break, just for a minute. To, to, if, if I could have this morning when John Martin was talking, I would have been running around the room with a flag going, is this guy on top of it in Ohio? I'm so impressed with what they've done to become the technology first state, the first technology first state. I wish it was Colorado. We had families at the forefront of technology, and we've got uh, uh, the Coleman Institute. We've got organizations like Imagine and other organizations that have been pushing technology for the longest time. Congratulations to Ohio. I wish it would have been Colorado, but it's not. Uh, so good for them. If I didn't think ImagineX was going to have an impact on the future of intellectual and developmental disabilities, I wouldn't stand here and talk about it in this way. There's some things that we have a history of and we knew about. Uh, the history of self-directed services goes back uh, m more than 20 years with us. The experience of the family recruited providers. Again, this is an interesting paper and pencil thing where we already knew we were going to have trouble recruiting employees, so we thought, well, let's share that responsibility with families and to have families go out and do the recruitment on, on their own behalf, recommend to us hiring people, and then they would schedule them, they would oversee their timesheets, they would ensure that they were documenting the work, and then we would, uh, again, bill for that and, and pay, the pay the employees. The workers were our, our, our employees right now. We have probably 120 to 150 families and about 250 employees engaged in this family uh, recruited provider program. <laughs> so when you look at this is already in place uh, from, a, from an operational standpoint, maybe a tool like ImagineAct, an Uber-like tool, can just um, overcome that and sort of uh, become the tool that's going to be used by, these, by the families. The other things that we have in place, uh, the trust of families. So when we say we have some, a new idea, this is a pretty cool thing to do, uh, families will give it a shot. Um, there are some things that we're gonna find out that is gonna, are gonna be a little bit more challenging for, for families. The challenges in the, in the employee side, um, I didn't know this until we kind of get into this discussion about ImagineX, that our HR department has to do a face-to-face uh, meeting with all new employees and it doesn't matter what the business is that has to happen and so when I learned about that I thought well how far can we expand this we can't expand this into the metro area we can't expand it outside of the state because we can't do a face-to-face -face. and a video face-to-face -face doesn't work for Department of Labor apparently training requirements it's our responsibility for training requirements when it comes to employees so when we were bringing on the new employees we're doing the background checks, we're doing the vetting, we're doing the training, 
it's our expense, and that's part of what we have to pay for out of our funding streams that are coming from the Medicaid waivers. Wouldn't matter where you are, that's gonna be the case. So we started to think about what about these other tools that are being used like Uber and Lyft, and, uh, and they're talking about other businesses and, and independent contractors. Now Uber will, will, if you do your homework on them, they're not a transportation company, they're a software company. That's what they're gonna say, and they are connecting independent contractors, drivers, with people who want to go from here to there. They're not employees. They do vet them. I just saw an article in the paper this morning. There was a difficulty in Colorado where there was a lawsuit in place, and the settlement is that Uber's going to have to spend a couple hundred million dollars to do background checks on everybody that they have as drivers. Even though they claim they do it already, apparently they weren't that clever with it, and they didn't keep up with it, and um, so that's part of the settlement. But again, they're independent contractors. We need to understand the difference between what is, who has to be an employee and who can be an independent contractor. We've been down that path before because that's how the family recruited employee program started. We treated the workers like independent contractors. They signed contracts and saying, I'm an independent contractor. The Colorado Department of Labor and Employment said, no, they're not. They're your employees. You're responsible for them. That's your liability. So we shifted gears and brought them in as employees in the family recruited employee, or they had to legitimately become an independent contractor in business on their own. This fits this model, be a little bit careful. Um, the families, although we have their trust, I think it's natural, anything that's going on with the internet and in the cloud, whether it's your banking, <laughs> there's just this level of, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I wanted a, a person in my home who came from the cloud. <laughs> Yet I'm okay with that if Mark comes and introduces them as a, my new, a, new, a new provider for me. Can we get over this um, concern in the cloud-based trust? Let's jump. So here's the fun part. Uh, I get to talk about the things we don't know. Um, one of those things that uh, men find very difficult to say is I don't know. We don't know a lot about the future. Um, we do know the app is intuitive. Families have told us that. Just as easy as, a, as an Uber app is for me to get from my house downtown, um, this app is just as smooth. Um, they're saying it's intuitive, it works well. Um, that part is good. We know the emerging tools like this are changing how we do everything. When I go to a restaurant, open table. When I go downtown, it's Uber or Lyft. When I want some work done in my home, I'm going to Home Advisor. I'm very comfortable with those tools now. They're easy, I'm used to it. I think that's spreading pretty quickly. Understanding, we're talking about metropolitan areas, this, you know, we're not talking about a rural area that's gonna have a, a tool like this be put to use, there's just not enough people. It's changing how we get stuff done. Can we include the support needs of individuals with intellectual disabilities and cognitive disabilities in this same kind of arena. I don't know why not yet, uh, so we're gonna proceed. This issue of employees versus contractors, I would love to cross that line. So currently, this is a work in progress, as Fred said, we are not rolled out um, uh, Shay asked us if we would come and in, in hear and talk about what we're working on. I would only do it in this environment. I wouldn't do it at a, a, at a regular conference for intellectual and developmental disabilities because we're not there yet. But there's so much potential here. The issue of employees versus independent contractors. If we could get where Uber is, and truly everybody that we were using as workers, so me as a parent, I can say, gee, I need somebody here Friday night for two hours. I throw it out there as an agent. Um, I see the variety of people responding. And if, it's, and if you're using the uh, web-based version as opposed to what's on your phone, you might see your favorite people faces come up. Here's the five people that responded. You know three of them. It's like, well, I'll take somebody I know. There's a comfort level we can provide. Um, if they're independent contractors, there's some liability release for us. There's some requirements that they do their own training. We vet them still. Our independent contractors are still vetted. We still do background checks. But now payment can be done a little bit differently. Just like Uber, 
those drivers are paid as soon as you get out of the car. We can do that. We can do that with employees. We're not. We're doing it on a weekly basis, but we could do it. There's a, there's a mechanism to do with employees, but we haven't gone down that path yet. The demand hasn't been there for that. But how much easier it would be for us to take an app like this and spread it to other geographic areas and say, if you're an independent contractor and we treat you like an independent contractor, we don't have to do a face-to-face. -face. We still do the background checks. We'll still vet you. You tell us you get your training in place. We'll have that packet of information come to you. We'll set you up as a, a new worker. Now, you could be a PT. You could be just doing cooking. You could be doing support needs, personal support needs. Doesn't matter what it is. Um, we will know just which categories of work you're willing and capable of working and your name will only show up, you will only be alerted on those types of tasks. The independent contractor issue, we think we can cross that line. Uh, where we are right now with the app is we have the ability to turn on um, credit card payment. We got it off right now. We are going down the path of trying to figure out how we can utilize our, in Colorado, the waiver funding services and only those services that, will, that are sustainable because of the rates that are paid. That's how we've made the family recruited employee program work. We're building in right now the ability of the app for the, employee, for the worker to, to, to track what they're doing and do the documentation in the app so that when it comes to us back in the office, we can bill for that service to the state. But if we combine that with credit card payments, one, two, three different families use different credit cards, all of a sudden that opens the door because of multiple payments to independent contracting. If it's a single payment stream and workers are only paid by Imagine, then they are our employees. But we can argue that if they're being paid by private, vendor, private people with credit cards, they're no longer our employee. We would like to go that way. We're not there, we can do it. It will be an argument we'll have. There'll be challenges with the Department of Labor. We're willing to end up to that challenge. Imagine X just a tool. It doesn't know anything about intellectual and development disabilities. It doesn't care what the task is. It doesn't care what the funding source is. It's just a tool. It's not a service, it's not a program. It's just a connecting device. If we can solve some of the issues that are in front of us, it doesn't matter where we do it. It needs to be within the United States because of our uh, development contracts. But just like Uber, Uber's all over the world now. Imagine that could be anywhere, it could be everywhere. Could be uh, a, a provider organization that needs uh, 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 support in a way that uh, uh, typically you would hire a, a temporary employee to come in. It's changing the way we look at who is going to be doing the work. If I'm now a person that needs something done for my son and daughter, everybody around me, my family, my neighbors, my religious contacts, doesn't matter who it is, everybody around me is a potential service provider now. It's not a recruitment of employees into a facility-based program. This could disrupt everything. Maybe there's no more facility-based day programs. Vermont's already gone down this path, but not using an app like this. What if? So there's so many unanswered questions here, but this could be an extremely disruptive tool. Host home and foster care providers looking for respite, their agents. They can say, I need somebody on Tuesday. I need somebody on the weekend. I'm gonna be gone. They could pay for that out of the credit card. The multiple funding streams are gonna open that door for us to recognize people as independent contractors. I'm confident that we can get on that path. Trust in the tool and the available workforce will be a key. We're not recruiting employees anymore if we go down this path. Now maybe we're marketing and doing a sales pitch for our new independent contractors to say, do you want to be part of this? Do you want to grow your business as an independent contractor? Here we are, just like Uber drivers. We're not there, but you can see where the path is. And I'm gonna add one more little feature because I think I have the moment to do it. A friend of mine, David Leslie from the East Coast is here, an acquaintance that we um, made about 10 years ago. And I was on the phone with him talking about a uh, different kind of software relationship we're developing. And on that phone call, this is the way the conversation went. 
This device knows who I am. This device knows where I am. This device knows who I'm near. If you've used AirDrop with photographs, it knows who I'm standing next to. It knows because of where I am, whose home I'm standing outside of. Since it knows who that is, it can also connect back into a data system that tells me what the plan of care is. Once we know what the plan of care is, I can look on it and say, oh, item number three, that's why I'm here. I'm here to help with personal care. This is how it went. Enter, done. EVV solved, documentation solved, connected to the right person solved, billing solved. We're not there, but that's where we're going. We don't need facility-based day services anymore. We might not even need facility-based residential services. We'll see, that's a whole other ball of wax. The only reason I would talk about this tool this way is because I think it can be that disruptive to the field we work in and beyond. It's not just intellectual and developmental disabilities, cognitive disabilities, and whatever other need is there from a personal standpoint, this might be able to resolve that. One thing that I am super happy about and proud about Imagine is we'd like to think that we're in the, in the, the arena of figuring out what's going to happen next in the world of intellectual and developmental disabilities, and I think this is sort of contributing to that.